Good evening, everybody. Um, before we start, um, just a, 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 just for me to understand, how many of us here already know what FAG is? Okay. How many of us here have experienced FAG live anywhere in the world? Oh, quite a bit. Okay. So, um, first and foremost, thank you very much for this invitation. Das, thank you. Um, a few weeks back, I was just down the road at Astoria, and many a times I've performed at, at Sunbeam uh, in the past with GV. Uh, so it's it's really it looks as if GV is bringing me back on this street because other than GV's house, I didn't know anything in Astoria um, until we had him. Uh, but anyway, um, Fad is um, before we start is a semi-classical western form of music. It's also known as an urban folk song, a folk song from a city. So it varies from a, a traditional folk song, as in you don't have a percussion instrument traditionally used, you don't have a dance, you don't have that groove, you know, the rhythm and a, and a folk dance to go along with it. So in that way, it's different from normal folk songs, so it's called an urban folk song. Um, origin of Fad, when did it start, where did it start, how did it start is quite uh, unknown. Um, and therefore, this, uh, there are a lot of theories. There are theories that Fad started in um, Africa. There are other theories that say that something like Fad, of course this has some uh, documentation. There was something called Fad, an art form called Fad in Brazil in the late 1700s. It's been documented in 1760. But that was a group dance and a group activity, song and dance. Very different from the Fadu that we know uh, today. Uh, there's also a theory that uh, Fadu was influenced by the Arabic music of when Portugal was part of that whole Moorish Iberian Peninsula. And, uh, and that, muse, that poetry um, remained in the, the people of Portugal and that's how they came, it came to a farm. But that theory sounds beautiful and I would love some document, some proof later on to say that it's true. But it has a very strong negation, a very strong um, debate because uh, that level of Arabic uh, poetry, which they're talking about uh, the 14th century, uh, would have been only among the elite who knew to read and write at that point of time. And then to have uh, hibernated for so many centuries and emerged in the 19th century from the lowest section of society didn't really seem to be a very probable uh, thing. Of course, they, I hope somebody sometime proves this uh, Arabic influence, Arabic poetry influence true. So, how do we say, um, how do we age, how do we uh, understand how old is the father? So there's this whole um, credit given to a person called Maria Savera. Um, a Savera, of course the picture that's there is not the lady herself. So a Savera or the Savera was a book written in the late 1800s uh, about a life of a girl who was born in 1820 and died in 1846 at the age of 26. And she was the daughter of a prostitute. Her mother is said to be extremely ugly, with a moustache and a beard. Um, and then this daughter of hers was very pretty and dainty and sang beautifully and even played the Portuguese guitar. And Maria Severa was in love with the Count, the 13th Count of Vinyoso, which is the title. And uh, as usual, they could not be one because society at that time wouldn't um, allow such things. Uh, and therefore, we believe that she died out of heartbreak because she couldn't be one with the man of her life um, at the young age of 26. And therefore, she sang Fadu with all this pain of, you know, and uh, melancholy and all this anguish and everything. And he used to visit, or he was part of the circles of Fadu because this count used to play the Portuguese guitar. So he must have been a scandalous um, son of the family, but he did. Uh, however, she died at the age of 26, and she has been given this credit, or rather, um, a whole mystical aura around her, 
till date. So till date you'll find people writing poetry um, about Maria Severa. Uh, for example, the father was beautiful when Maria Severa sang it. Uh, today's father is nothing like that because she's no more. Things like that, you know. So they would still refer to her. Um, and uh, that's the, uh, the, the platform, or that's the level they've kept Maria Severa on. So in the late 1800s, a book was written on Maria Severa by Julio Dantes. And in 1931, the movie was made called A Severa, which was the phonofilm, the first movie in Portugal to have sound. And it's really nice that they chose the book A Severa to make their first movie. So the, the lady you see there is the actress. There is no a recorded image of the actual Maria Severa. No photographs, of course, but no paintings, no portraits either. So therefore, it's it's just a beautiful girl and um, and her house exists in this quarter of Lisbon to date, to date called Moriria. And in front of her house, there's, a, there's an open space, a larum. And there on one of the walls is a pretty painting. I'm, I'm not sure how, how long that painting is going to last there. I saw it four years ago. It was just the back of a very pretty girl with a shawl, the triangular shawl that's used for fav, and just her hair tied, and that's it. You can't see the face, but it's, it's so pretty that you can only imagine how pretty she must have been. And that's how they have kept Maria Severa alive through the fav. So we can say that the fav that we know of today and the way it is sung today began during this love affair of Maria Severa and the 13th Count of Vinyos. So that was in the early 1800s. He died in 1865, she died in 1846. Um, and then the fag got developed, it, um, it got, it, it had, we have to understand that it came from a particular section of society where not a lot of people were accomplished musicians. And therefore the very early compositions are simple. Uh, some of the traditional fags still date uh, only of two chords. You just play two chords and it's the full full fad. But highly appreciated fad. These are not nursery lines, they're really highly appreciated fad. The emphasis of course always goes on the lyrics and uh, and the emotion and the way the singer conveys it. Uh, and that's how fad developed. Uh, it then went in the late um, in the late 1900s, so that's nearly a century after fad got some sort of a structure. It got into a new form called Fad Kansam, which means a Fad song. Kansam is nothing but a song. And uh, so the difference is traditional Fad and Fad Kansam. Fad Kansam is like a song. It has a verse and a chorus, which the traditional Fad doesn't have. Traditional Fad is just verse and verse and verse. It just goes. So it's the same melody, repetitive. It can get very boring if you don't follow the language or if you don't love Fad. So a poet or singer could write maybe four verses and come and sing to you four verses and the traditional father would be over. It could be 12 verses, it could be 36 verses, any number, depending on what he was singing about or what he had written about. Uh, then came Father Kansang and it was more appealing, especially to the non-Portuguese speaking crowd. Because if you don't follow the language and if it's a monotonous melody that's played, it, it gets um, boring. So when uh, a particular lady that we will talk about in short, uh, shortly um, took Fadu abroad. She preferred singing Fadu Kansang because it sort of engaged her foreign audiences. That lady's name is Amalia. Amalia Rodrigues, the queen of Fadu. So in the late 1900s, or the second half of the 1900s, uh, Fadu Kansang became very popular and she took it all over the world. So. The purists find that Fadu Kansam is not a pure form of Fadu. But today, we are at the next level. We are at something we call, we don't know what to call it, we call it modern Fadu. And that is anything and everything. And there are books written. Can you sing anything and everything and call it the Fadu? Uh, because you have rap, you have, I mean, it's, you know, it's got um, heavy metal music, it's, you've got drum kits, you, so things that, are very, very different from the traditional Fadu. Fadu Kansam was still a sort of a, uh, some sort of a, a discount given, you know. But this is like very different. And so now the purists are 
have started accepting Fadu Kansam as part of traditional Fadu. So it sort of got promoted. Um, so that's that's how the, the types of Fadu or the structure of Fadu has evolved. When we talk about Fadu, we also talk about two styles of Fadu. And one of the styles is from the city of Coimbra, and the other one is from the city of Lisbon. Uh, Coimbra um, is a university city. It's a very ancient, traditional, very respected university of Europe. And this um, town of Coimbra revolves around the university. It's a, it's a haunted place if you go there during vacations. Because there's nobody, there's nothing happening there. The restaurants are closed because students have gone home. Um, there's nothing else happening there. So it's, it's, it really lives today. It, it lives uh, because of the university. And this Father the Queen is usually sung by gentlemen singers. Um, it could be sung solo. It could be sung in a group. If you notice, all of them are draped in this cape, a black colored cape, which is part of their, I wouldn't say uniform, but part of their outfit of being students of a university. You have these capes from the different universities and then they have badges and things like that, but in Coimbra it's very, very important. Has anybody here visited Coimbra? This university, the old, the old uh, building, of course now there are lots of buildings with more uh, fields and more subjects have come up. But the, the old one, which now houses the Department of Law, and I think Science, if I'm not mistaken, is, um, has a square in the center, has the chapel, and has the ancient library. And to enter it, you have to go through an iron gate, which was probably the main gate at that time. Now the tradition says that if you have your cape with you, mind you, this is already at a very high level. You've probably climbed 75 steps to reach this square. And now you're going to enter the iron gate. So the tradition says, if you have the cape with you, you need to put it on both your shoulders. So if you just carried it with your laptop and your bag and everything else, you have to leave everything down, drape it, and then carry your stuff, just for entering and going under the gate. And they have, in their, in their university, they have something known as spies. So there are spies that check out. And if you don't do that, then there is you know, ragging and whatever. But there are a lot of these traditions that are part of the student community of the university. So this cape is not just something you wear for, for uh, festive occasions in university. It's a very, very integral part of. And if you meet any person who studied in the University of Coimbra, you will then realize the, the reverence that they have to that cape. So it's very, very. Um, uh, an important part of their student life in that university. And therefore, they'll always wear it when they sing the path. Now, if you've noticed here, all the singers are gentlemen. That's another peculiarity of Fadul Kuimra. This is usually sung only by gentlemen, traditionally sung only by gentlemen. Today, there are, there are rebels and there are things have changed. Ladies do sing. But traditionally, it's only sung by gentlemen. Another very uh, peculiar feature of Father de Coimbra, when somebody finishes a Father de Coimbra, you don't clap, you clear your throat. <coughs> you just cough. And that probably comes from the fact that a lot of Father de Coimbra was used for serenading once the ladies arrived or there were ladies in the city of Coimbra. So the students would go in groups late at night with the guitars, and so the gentleman who wanted to propose or impress a lady would stand and sing, if, but with his support. He needed support, so there would be a crowd, a group with him. And then, of course, there would be some indication, either flickering of the lights or, or some, some indication that you know, the, the girl was impressed or not. Um, and therefore, it was not a performance for an applause. So at the end of it, if mission was accomplished, or if the guy had done a good job and sung well, <coughs> was appreciation enough. And that tradition, people till date continue. And it's amusing, but uh, it's part of the umpteen number of traditions in Fadu de Pienda, which is very different from Fadu de Nishboa. Um, this is the queen of Fadu. She sang Fadu de Quimbra, breaking rules, but basically it's Fadu de Nishboa. And Lisbon or Lisboa is the capital city of Portugal. And the other style of Fadu, the style that I primarily um, sing, um, 
is sung by both ladies as well as gentlemen. It is 99% mm, never sung in a group, unless there's a, a special concert or something. It's usually a solo. It could be a dishgarada, which means um, like a jugalbandi or a sawal jawab type of thing, where you have two to three singers. But other than that, it will not be like a choir performance, like Father the Kulimra is sung. They have choirs performing Father together. And, um, and Father the Lishboa is, Lishboa is where Maria Severa lived, and that's how the whole, the, with the count and that whole story in Moradia. Uh, you have certain areas of Lisbon where you have traditional houses of Fadu or places where Fadu happens. And this lady is given the credit for taking Fadu International. Um, a very cute thing to note that Amalia Rudrich was born in 1920, exactly a hundred years after Maria Severa. So Maria Severa was born and the Fadu was also born. And a hundred years later, Amalia was born. Amalia came from um, not a very well-to-do family. Uh, she used to sell oranges with, when she was young. Uh, but she got into singing father at a very young age. By 1940, to the age of 20 or so, she was already singing in Kasaj de Fadu, in professional places where you have father and son. And she was being paid the highest amount of salary uh, of that time. So she, she was being paid more than senior artists who had been singing father for, for a very long time. By 1940s, she had already taken, by 1943, I believe, was her first trip abroad. And Fadu, for the Portuguese uh, community, if you, if you understand, is a very, very um, integral part of their uh, um, patrimony, part of their culture. Uh, heritage and um, and it's something that they don't want to part with something they're very possessive about and the purists oh then we cannot do it. there's no there's no excuse it is something that cannot be shared and understood and uh, replicated by anybody else but those are purists um, but she taking father abroad must have had some sort of a, a reaction but the end result was excellent because when she did that and she went singing all over Europe, um, the French noticed her and noticed the father. And father reached the French movies. And there were movies made and she was also an actress and she acted in a Portuguese film as well um, regarding uh, the life of a singer, Storia de Macanta Deira. And she got the Best Actress of the Year award for that, Amalia. Of course, she didn't go ahead into movies. There was just a, a phase in her life. And then she went all over the world. She sang Fahd from New York to Japan. She's been to Israel. She's been everywhere. And she's even been to Goa. Unfortunately, she came to have a, a live performance in Goa very, very late. I believe in the year 1999. Sorry, 1990. Um, born in 1920. She was already 70 years old and she passed away in 1999. So just nine years before she passed on, um, she came to Goa and there was a performance, a concert, which was full house and, and overflowing and people sitting on the steps of Kala Academy Auditorium and, uh, and she performed in Goa. But many years prior to that, her voice was already playing in the houses in Goa uh, through the radio, uh, through the uh, emissora. And um, people didn't realize the impact that she had already had on the music lovers of Goa decades before she arrived. Um, so Amalia is, is always and will always, I believe, be called uh, the Queen of Fab for everybody. However, maybe because only her LPs and her recordings reached the side, everybody in Goa, the old generation especially, adores Amalia and for them father is equal to Amalia and there's nothing else around it. But we have to give credit to many other artists, her contemporaries, before her, after her, around her era. The lady in the center, Maria Teresa de Noronha, came from uh, aristocratic families and uh, she had a very um, delicate voice. She, um, she didn't um, have a lot of glamour to her career 
but she had a lot of knowledge of the farm. She had a radio program for years wherein she spoke about traditional farm and she performed traditional farm on the radio uh, in Portugal. Irmini Silva was older, so prior to Amalia, her career had already started, taken off. Alfred Marceneiro is much before Amalia. So there were some fathers that Amalia sang which were written and composed by Alfred Marceneiro. Lucilia do Carmo was roughly a contemporary, whose son, Carlos do Carmo, is going to sing this November uh, his retirement concert. So he's going to have his last series of concerts and retire from live singing. So he's still singing. And Maria the Fair is also a contemporary who till date sings, but much less compared to Karnju Karnu is younger, of course. Um, but they're all of, of Amalia's rough era, roughly the same um, era. So these are different singers and there are many more. It's not just these, there are many, many more. Uh, but as I said, Amalia has did something that none of them did or nobody had done till then. She actually took Fado all over the world. Um, there's a joke, um, I like to mention this. It's just an anecdote. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's a joke. So there was this place where travelers met, probably on a ship or somewhere, in some city in the world. And they all were talking about their own places and their own countries. So somebody said, I'm from this country. And then, and then this uh, person said, I'm from Portugal. So they where is Portugal? Oh, it's in Europe. Yeah, but where in Europe? It's in this side and north, south, west, east, everything. And they were still lost. Okay, so what do you all do in Portugal? What do you all eat? We eat codfish or we eat this or we eat that. Okay, fine. Okay, but still nothing, you know, was appealing. And then, okay, what, what, what else do you all do? Oh, we have a very nice music form called the Fag. And when the person said that, they said Amalia. So Amalia was more famous. The joke is Amalia was more famous at one point of time than Portugal itself. But this is in the in the 1900s, of course. Now, when you talk about chronolo chronologies of the father and what exactly happened, so roughly Maria Severa's life, father started, and then it, it, it got, and there were these two types of father of Coimbra and father of Lisboa. It sort of went into traditional, uh, a lot of development in the traditional father, a lot of bifurcations, a lot of compositions. And then you had, of course, the father can sound that came about. Amalia took Father Kansam abroad for all her concerts, and that's how Father grew. Um, but we also need to know a little bit about what was happening in Portugal around that time. Um, Salazar, the dictator, uh, the minister who then returned to a dictator, of course, um, used to promote Father a lot. And probably that's another reason why uh, Father had its glorious years before the revolution in Portugal, um, which happened in 74. So Salazar was ruling till 68, I think 68, he had a stroke, 70, he passed away, 1968, 1970. Prior to that, for about three and a half decades, he ruled. And he used to, there's, it's another anecdote that they, they say, and it's, it's written also in many places, that he sort of diverted the attention of the masses so that they wouldn't really know what he was doing he diverted the, the attention of the masses to three things. One was Fag, one was Fatima, the place where, the holy place where Mother Mary was seen, the apparition. And so, you know, a lot of emphasis was given to Fatima and a lot of pilgrimages, a lot of things, a lot of build, um, construction was done there. And, you know, that whole holy thing was uh, created. So people became very religious, so Fatima and football. Uh, and football is still date uh, one of their very, again, like father, they're very possessive and very um, fanatic sometimes. Uh, for example, they give a form, you have to write an uh, admission form for something, I don't know, to school or to, to, to a college or something. The, like how we have today a category says, that says caste, and many of us don't want to fill it. They have the football team. <laughs> so there are basically two footballs. I think it is uh, Benfica and uh, uh, and the other one. I can't get the name. Lisboa. Mm, no, not Lisboa. Benfica and uh, Sporting. Sporting, yes. Benfica and Sporting. And one is green and one is red. So there are colors and you know. And there are memberships. So there's, I know a gentleman, Goan origin, no sorry, Dama origin from Daman. Um, has lived a lot of his life in Macau and still lives in Macau but has a house in Portugal. 
He has already got his grandson registered in Sporting. <laughs> the little fellow doesn't even know what Sporting and Benfica is. But he's already got a membership, life membership and things like that. So it's that much, you know. So uh, football, Fatima and Fadu were three things that they say Salazar distracted the masses um, and kept them very happy in these three things. And, um, and he ruled as a dictator. So what happened was Fadu got associated with that regime. And when that regime was toppled, the father also had a downfall. So in 1974, uh, 1970 as I mentioned, Salazar died and then there was the military um, coup d'etat that happened in, uh, on 25th of April 1974, revolution of the carnations and, and all names given. And, um, and post this, the father had a very, very sharp, or uh, very steep downfall. So Casas do Fado, places of Fado, where musicians used to go and play every day, and singers used to go and sing. Singers were not always professional, they were people who had normal jobs, and then would write all their woes and you know, whatever, aspirations or whatever, and then go and sing in the evening. It was part of their culture, part of their, you know, uh, socializing. All of a sudden were closed. You know, they had to shut shop. Because a lot of the revolutionaries, uh, associated it with Salazar, including Amalia. At this point of time, Amalia had gone to Brazil. I'm not sure whether she had gone on a holiday or she was already married to a Brazilian. I'm not sure which of those trips, but she was in Brazil. So when she comes back to Portugal, there's suddenly this thing, don't go to sing Fado, don't sing Fado. And Amalia is confused because she's Amalia because of Fado. So in, in, a, in a movie, it's shown very beautifully. She wants to sing Fado and, you know, and it is true because the generation that was in their youth in 74, Portuguese youth who were, you know, in their prime at that time, are totally disconnected from the father. Which is something people in Goa don't understand. If you are Portuguese, you should know at least five fathers by heart. But if the Portuguese person is of that generation, and I know many of them, uh, they have this whole um, disconnect with, with the father. So, Father started in whatever Melisever's life, it went up, it went from the low sections of society, it reached aristocracy, as I mentioned, Maria, Maria Teresa de Noronha, the singer was from aristocratic families, from nobles, and then all of a sudden it had this whole downfall because of the revolution. We also had a similar thing in Goa. So the father arrived in Goa in the late 1800s, it was already playing in the radio, Amalia's LPs were all over, everyone knew her father by heart in Goa. And then in 61, with uh, the liberation, there was a cutoff, and there was no communication. So what happened to father from 61 till approximately the early 80s, Goa doesn't know. Uh, so the, the, the father lovers of the old generation are stuck with those fathers that Amalia made famous prior to 61. And even Amalia's fathers that came about after that are unknown to them. So although they are Amalia's fans, they don't know the fathers that came about after 61. There's a slight disconnect there. Very similar to what happened in Portugal. However, with the change in the millennium and late 1900s, um, you suddenly see this new generation of cow singers. And I'm sure some of you will, will know these singers. Marisa is considered a very, very famous international father singer. Uh, but I must say that the purists don't really like her style. They find she's too dramatic, too theatrical on stage. And Fado traditionally is a very non-theatrical performance. Um, the singer will, if it's a lady, she would have a shawl, her hands would be holding the shawl, her eyes would be closed and she'd be singing. So that's the pose, you know. And suddenly Marisa was, would sit on the stage and she would stand and she would cry on the stage and then um, a very unconventional hairstyle, you know, which is, it's a a lot of the purists don't really like, but internationally, especially among the Portuguese who have settled down in Canada or, or wherever, in France or wherever, uh, the second generation, the third generation, they just love her because they find, you know, it's, it's more in, there's some involvement with the audience rather than just a performance. Anna Mora is another artist who has now performed all over the world and she's collaborated with various English, American, uh, European artists, so she's also done very well. And the gentleman of this generation, Fadish says is Kamane, beautiful voice, short fellow, beautiful voice. And uh, the rumors that I've heard is he doesn't sing in Kazar Zufadu anymore because he's claustrophobic. 
so he has to sing only in auditoriums. But his voice deserves an auditorium. It's really a, a very, very. Um, it's not a. It's not a strong voice. It's not like a Pavarotti, but you know, it's a very nice voice. And he's got two brothers who are also into Pavarotti singing. One of them is here. Uh, well, these are also international level artists uh, who have taken Pavarotti abroad. But I have a connect with all of them. They're all my friends. So that's why they're all on this slide. So this lady is from Angola, was from Angola, she passed away. Um, Anna was her name, Anna Maria. And in 2008, when I went to Portugal, and I used to sing in one of these castles of Fabio, as and when I was free, I would go there and I would, they would allow me to sing. Um, it was very cute because they had a Portuguese, Portuguese, Portuguese singer, and then they had the Angolan singer, and then they had an Indian singer. So for that one, two months that I was there, it was a curious thing that they had three races singing the Fav. Of course, I was very new to the Fav, and uh, she, unlike many other singers, maybe they were, they were, um, um, they had some, um, the word. they were scared, or not scared, what's the word? Inhibitions. Um, inhibitions. And uh, they sort of, you know, would only be very judgmental, you know. Some of them. Some of them wouldn't say anything. No good, bad, you can improve or your disasters, nothing. And this lady was the one who would open her songbook. Learn this one, copy it down. This is very nice. You should sing this one. And then the next day she would make me sing it and you know work with me. And then after that she would try this one also. Of course she was also a diehard fan of Amalia. So I used to tease her. I said, you're my madrinha, my godmother in Fargo. Um, and she really had a fadishta life. She died on the steps of that Casa do Fado where she had sung for years. She just collapsed there one day. And uh, so, I mean, I don't think any other Fadishta would, uh, any Fadishta would like to die anywhere else, you know. She was actually at the steps of that house. Um, and so the same place uh, we, I used to sing. Um, Kate Guerrero, the extreme uh, right, she arrived, these are four of them that have performed in Goa. Uh, Kate Guerrero came here with uh, the Portuguese uh, president when he arrived some years back, quite a few years ago. And uh, she sang in Kala Academy. Um, and I had a chance to sing with her, and then I met her in Portugal later. Kuka Rosetta was the most recent, I think a couple of years back. This was in Kala Academy DMK Auditorium. Uh, Mariana Bobon came in 2008 along with another singer, and, um, and it, she comes from the similar lineage as Maria Teresa de Noronha. And what is very cute just to mention here, her uncle, who visited Goa before, um, passed away, but Manuel Bobon. If you know the Mando, Adios Kotsovir Paolo, the Goan Konkani Mando, very famous, he penned down Portuguese lyrics to this Mando. He lived all his life in Portugal, but he used to associate with the Goan Cultural Association there. And uh, although he never lived in Goa, he's some sort of uh, attraction with the Goan uh, culture there. And he wrote, it's not a translation, but it's a beautiful poem, and it really has that same emotion of, uh, of farewell, because Adios Corso Vir Paolo is a, is a mando of, uh, of Fedel. It's quite sad. And the Portuguese lyrics are also beautiful. That's her uncle. And as I said, Pedro Moutinho came here, I think, uh, sorry, he's the most recent, uh, two, two, two years back. And he sang at the Mont Music Festival. And he's the brother of Kamane, the other gentleman uh, that I mentioned. So this is now a new generation of Hadishas. And younger than these have also already arrived in Portugal. And things have changed. There's one singer called Gisela João, whose first video that went international, she sang Fadu, not standing, seated on a bed, in a messy bedroom. And she was in micro shots. So it's changed. Fadu has changed. And the cover, the cover of, of Fadu, of her album, uh, is the name of the album is Nua, which means nude. And she's actually nude. And it, it's, a, it's a total... Um, opposite of what probably Maria Severa and all the other singers <coughs> thought Fadu would be. But Fadu is evolved and evolution is required otherwise the purists are also required and the evolution is also required otherwise the, any art form would, would not uh, would die. Just for your knowledge, Fadu traditionally is accompanied by these two instruments. We have the Portuguese guitar which is a pear-shaped 12-string instrument, um, generally played with false nails. So the guitarist will um, attach a nail to the index finger and to the thumb, 
and strum this way. So it's not like a you know, normal strumming of a guitar. Um, so that's the Portuguese guitar, which are usually handmade in Portugal and therefore very difficult to find in music shops all over the world. Um, there is a study being done and people have Portuguese guitars that were constructed in Goa at one point of time. They used to be slightly smaller. I don't know what's the reason, maybe ladies used to play. Um, and there are some of them still existing in Goa. So the Portuguese guitar was constructed. Today the Portuguese guitars that come from Portugal with our humidity sometimes get bumps and, and lose shape and detune and things like that and lots of problems. So we have three um, at the moment, three musicians that play the Portuguese guitar in India. Uh, two of them in Goa and one is was in Bangalore, he's gone back home to Mizoram. So Dinesh, uh, Frank Schubert and Orlando, these are the three guitarists. So if I had, there was a time if I had to have a concert, I had to knock one of these three doors and ask them to accompany me. Uh, and many a times they were busy. Dinesh as it is was in Bangalore, teaching in the Bangalore School of Music. Um, so I, then I had to make do with uh, mandolins and other versions, but um, but this is traditionally. And the classical guitar or the box guitar, Spanish guitar, uh, in Fad, is called the viola de Fad. I think it's tuned slightly differently and it's plucked. It gives the bass and the rhythm of the song. So if you have to sing a Fad, you need the viola de Fad. Although Everywhere they say that the Portuguese guitar is the backbone of the father, inseparable. But to sing just with the Portuguese guitar is impossible or it's very difficult, it's very challenging to the guitarist because the rhythm and the bass comes from uh, the viola. So these are the two instruments that, uh, that are used to traditionally accompany. Of course today there's everything that's been used as I mentioned. And we also have experimented, so we've done, I've done fag with sitar, I've done fag with the bansuri, the tablas of course, with the santur. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, with the uh, double bass is also being used in the western world, we used it here as well. Um, so there are, there are a lot of uh, experimentations being done. If you get a chance to go to Lisbon, please do not miss this building. It is the museum of fag. It's, um, it's based in the, in the Alfama area, where, which is full of Casas de Fal. So you go to see the museum, it's got, uh, it's got um, they made an auditorium, they have some, it's beautiful, very well done and a uh, very cute museum. So do try to visit Museo de Fal. Talking about what happened with Fado in Goa. So now Fado is safe in Portugal, we have the new generation, Felicia, of course there's evolution and it's just going all over the place. In Goa, we had the old generation that loved the Fado. Fado was being played on the radio. 61 happened and things sort of diluted. And, you know, Fado remained uh, imprisoned in certain families, in certain homes, in certain circles, which followed the Portuguese language and that loved the Fado. Uh, but then again, as I say, they were the same Fados that were being sung, uh, you know, the same ones that were famous prior to 61. However, with internet and then with relations uh, improving, with travel being uh, becoming easier, a lot of CDs and audio cassettes and then CDs um, and now MP3s and now it's internet. So things have changed. Uh, the effort that we have made, um, I've been singing for the last 16 years. Um, initially it was my solo struggle, so going to Portugal, knocking at doors, getting information, learning, because there's no structured course to learn the path. So there's no place that I could have gone. And at that point of time, the Museum of Father didn't have. Now they have some sort of courses. But at that time, they didn't have. So I had to actually go to the places, make friends like my godmother, uh, many other people. And then some people, of course, opened doors to me. And they really understood that you know there was this thirst to know uh, and learn about traditional father and its and details. And so that's how I accumulated all this information. Um, and then I felt here in Goa, the audiences that used to come for father concerts, now it's not, like a decade had happened of me singing the father, uh, was dwindling down. Because may, many of them were from the senior citizen category and many of them were passing on. And the number was reducing. So I felt this need of popularizing father um, among people who were not the regulars and not the children of the regulars, you know. And because it's, it's a music form, it's, a, it's an art form. If you like it, you like it. You don't need to know the language, you don't need to be a citizen of that country. You can, you know, just love it. And that's how um, a project in 2016 was launched. 
for Fab in the City. Um, anybody here attended any of these concerts of Fab in the City? No. So 2016 monsoons. We started in late May and we ended in October. The monsoons of 2016. We had 10 concerts all over Goa. Some of them were out. We even went to Daman with one of the concerts. These were uh, free concerts. Uh, to popularize Fadu. So what we did is we had each concert with a different theme, therefore different Fads and different venues. Not the normal Kala Academy or Portuguese Consulate or Funda Samorian because these are the places where you would expect something of Fadu. But we needed to go to the crowds that were not coming to these places when there was Fadu happening. And therefore we went, we, I think not most we came to um, Santa Rita um, Reserve next to Kingfisher Villa in that area. Is that Kanduli or Kalum? That area, Kandali. yes. I'm sorry, I'm very bad in the north of Goa. Project Cafe. Project Cafe happened recently. That was not part of Father in the City. Yes, Project Cafe happened recently. Uh, but this was 2016. Um, then we went, there was this beautiful restaurant called Marakash in Burburi. Yes, so we had a concert there. Uh, then of course we had Bay 15 and uh, these were the restaurant areas and Nostalgia in Raya which was the grand finale. And then we had at Sunaprant in the, the open air um, theatre. He doesn't like this night. <laughs> she doesn't like this night. Well, she likes us to... Really, really, really yes. coming home. Okay. <laughs> Please. So, um, so we took it to different places. We went to the Figueredo mansion in Lothuli uh, before it opened up to what it is now and, you know, opens uh, venue. Uh, so different sort of places, heritage places. Uh, uh, we even went... We what happened was every concert was full house. We had to turn away people because there was no place for them to sit. Figure the house. We had calculated 60 seats. We ended up crossing 100. So people sat on these seats which were behind doors and they had to you know, actually do that and, and look. To, because they couldn't see the, the area where we were performing. And even then there were people in the outer room. There's a small room outside the dining room of Figure and uh, they sat there. They could only listen. And then they would have to come and stand in front of the door, peep and go again and sit somewhere else. So, you know, things like that. So every time we were turning people away, Suna Prant, we uh, expected, we, that was our first concert, we expected 60 to 80, but uh, the amphitheater was totally full, which was above 100, and then we had another, I don't know how many chairs, and those chairs were full, and people were still standing. So, then we had a concert at the Institute Minas Braganza, which is 400 seater. So, we said, all of you who have been turned away, please come, this is a, you know, there's lots of space. But even there, we had about 250 people in the crowd. So this, con this series of 10 concerts really did well and it went to different places and since every time the concert was different, a lot of our fans repeated, you know, they came for the concerts. These concerts had a lot of information also sh shared and there was a booklet that was printed in the series which I have brought copies for all of you, so please feel free to pick them up. Of course, there are lots of advertisements there because 10 concerts without tickets, some, some money had to be raised, so we raised it that way. But the booklet also has 10 pages, 15 pages of information on the FAB, which were, these booklets were freely uh, distributed to all the audiences of all the 10 concerts. So please feel free, you'll, you'll get a lot of information on the FAB. From Fadu in the City came about the next project, which I'm at the moment extremely involved in, and that's called Fadu the Boer. You see these huge crowds here? This is our first batch, which we did in Margaon in the beginning of 2017. We started Fadu classes in Goa. And these classes had to be, the module had to be designed because there was no module that I could refer to. Uh, so it was basically a design for a student from Goa. So Portuguese is not your first language, Fadu is not happening in your house every day. So that's sort of a student and how would that student understand the Fadu? So the whole thing was designed that way. And that was the outcome of our first batch. Um, and then yes, of course, they were given certificates initially. We had the support of the Taj group of hotels and resorts through their CSR, they were supporting us. And we did a batch in Margaon with 35 students, Panjim with 55 students, Vasco with 75 students, and then Margaon called us back with another batch of 35 students. Uh, 2000, um, uh, you can see a lot of our students then had opportunities to perform. Um, and this is a, a performance um, in a corporate. And you have our students here who took part and won at the Fadu Singing Competition, which happens once a year. This year it's on 16th of November, Institute Minas Braganza. So our students not only learned the Fadu and, you know, uh, liked it, but they also made use of it. 
2018, we uh, had a mega concert. We had two concerts. I don't know if anybody attended it. 20 years of singing in heaven. Because 2019, this year, it completes 20 years of Amalia's passing on. So it was called 20 years of singing in heaven. And the concert was not only about Amalia, but we also had certain other characters uh, enacted and dressed. So the, the student would dress up like a particular Fadishta and, and sing. Um, there was a, a team of uh, students on the side that, that did a sort of a theatrical performance, which actually was the narration in between. So there wasn't like a compare coming in, you know, stating what's coming next. So it was beautifully done. So we had theater, we had a small dance performance, we had video and of course we had performances. Some of them were character performances like this lady here. She was the character of the sister of Amalia, Selesh, who was also a spouse singer who passed away in 2018. So we paid a tribute to her. And that was the team. We were 65 in number. All students of Father Dugo from four batches. And not all of them went on stage to sing. So the singers and then you also had the makeup people were also students. The hairstylists were also students. People helping with the sound and the light engineers were also students. The volunteers were also students. So the entire team was of 65 and um, I think it was a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm not sure if something like this has been done anywhere else in the world outside of Portugal where a team of that size has worked together for a father concert or a father musical performance. Just uh, this brings me to the end of my talk uh, because this is where we are right now. We are actually in our fifth batch of FAB. And uh, we've got support now from the Deccan Heritage Foundation and the Bagri Foundation based in the UK. And so we are able to start our fifth batch and this batch is in Mapsa. So we've tried to come this side because still now we were not able to. And that's why I was in Astoria because we had an introductory talk. So people who wanted to learn the FAB who were spoken were told about this course and then asked to join the classes. Um, we went everywhere. We tried to actually sweep through Bardej to get everybody together and the classes happen in Mapsa. We've already finished two classes. It's just in case any one of you wants to join, you still have a chance because we accept students till the third class that is coming Sunday. 11.30 coming Sunday at St. Jerome Church Hall. We already have 85 students. We don't mind crossing 100 because we really don't know when we are going to come up north again. Um, you know, so we've got students coming from Panjim, we've got students coming from Ponda with me, I, they come along with me all the way. Um, today I had conversation with two mothers who want to come with their kids from Margaon. I don't know how they're going to manage that road, it's such a bad situation there, but they want to come to, to Maksa. So if you know of anybody who would like to join, you don't need to know the language, you don't need to be uh, accomplished in music at all. You don't have to be a singer, you know, because there's a lot of theory that we teach apart from singing. And in this course of 10 classes, there are no fees for the courses. And in this course of 10 classes, each student learns five fads. And five different fads. So if you will understand one fad of the Quimbra, one fad of the Lisboa, one fad of the Kansam, one traditional fad. And you know, so there are different types of fads. So the student not only learns five songs, but understands to distinguish and identify fad. So just to end, this is an announcement. We will accept new students. Uh, on the coming Sunday, I think it's 25th if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can just have to be there at 11.30, bring a photograph and ID proof just for our forms. If you don't bring that, you can bring the next Sunday, don't worry. <laughs> but um, do join us if you think you would like to be part of this uh, Father Leo. Sorry? A football team, yes. Yeah. <laughs> With the rosary from Fatima. <laughs> Um, yes. we've, we've really I got some nice students and uh, from this classes then we pick up students that have real sing singing talent and then I work uh, with master classes, you know, one on one with them and some of them have really, uh, you know, outdone our expectations. Uh, we've got two sisters all the way from Kurturi, Prabhu Desai, um, Shristi and Swara and both the girls are doing extremely well in father singing. So they were in our first Margaon batch, in the, the next Margaon batch their mother joins. And the mother is an Indian Hindustani uh, classical singer and she teaches Hindustani classical, but she's come to learn the father. Uh, we have a lot of families that attend. We have grandfathers coming with their grandchildren, we have mothers with children, the whole family, father, mother, children, everybody. <laughs> Siblings coming, cousins coming, it's, it's very nice. We have a lot of fun in the classes. Um, so again, an invitation. 
since uh, next Sunday uh, we still accept uh, admissions and registrations, please feel free. You just have to be 10 years and above. There's no upper <laughs> limit. There's no upper limit. And if you, if the participant is 10 years and below, or rather below than 10, it has to be the child has to be accompanied by an adult, because I, I'm not sure if the child below 10 is going to take down any notes or write down anything, because there is an exam. So you need to have some notes. It's it's a it's a it's a simple exam, don't worry. It's just for us to know what you understood. That's all. Um, so yes, that's basically what I wanted to share with you regarding the father evolution of father, the journey that it's. It's um, done in Portugal, in its own life, and the journey that it's doing here in Goa. Um, open to questions. Keep in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But we don't know what a father's like. Oh, yes. <laughs> Are there any father houses? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't get any Are there any father houses operational in Panjim? Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Oh, I would be guillotined for not mentioning this. Uh, we've recently started something called a Kazugufa in Goa. It's a dream come true for all of us who have been uh, lovers of father and who have been working with the father. It's not really equivalent to the Kazu Gofado in Portugal where you can go and have a meal. Some of them you have meals, some of them just have snacks. What we have tried to do is we have we've, uh, created a place in um, SIPA. SIPA is the center for Indo-Portuguese arts. And in this center there is one room that is dedicated to Fagu and Mando. And this place is called Madre Goa. And Madre Goa happens to be an old quarter of Lisbon which also happened to have Fagu. But we have chosen Madre Goa because it also has Goa in it. And, uh, and therefore, we have uh, we've recently started, we just had three uh, of such experiences of Fagu. There is going to be one or two on the 24th of, um, of this uh, month. Um, maybe I could send a uncle the, the poster and he could circulate it in your WhatsApp um, circle. So that's our effort to have a Kazu do Fagu. And uh, we are hoping to take it further. We might have workshops there. It's not only Fado based. Sipa is probably the hand painted tiles. You'll have something to do with how to dance the mando. They'll be having workshops later on. But right now, we're just starting off with the Fado experiences. It's about an hour experience. You listen to the Fado, you understand the Fado, and of course, you have some Indo Portuguese snacks which are specially made for that event. Uh, this is. On the river road, as you enter Panjim, you cross the old secretariat and you move ahead, there's a road that comes in and you move ahead, it's the first building to your left. So it's on that, it's in that block. So after the secretariat, there's a road that comes out if you were coming from, from the court, that side. And then you move ahead, it's on the river road, so it's, it's bang opposite uh, daddy, big daddy, the casino, the new one, the white tents that are there. It's just opposite that. It's on the first floor. You'll find there's only one beautiful door there uh, in that block. Yeah, because the others are shops. I think it's a Bridgestone showroom at the turn. And it's like two shutters later is the entrance. So it's the entire first floor. Part of it has been converted to SIPA. It's a 200 year building. Um, the flooring and the doors that were restored are, most of it is original. Uh, it's just been, you know, revived and polished and that's it. So it's a pretty place just to even have a round if you want to go. Um, yes, I know I have to sing a part. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I should use the mic or not. I think I'll use the mic because of the fans. Um, so this, I'll, I, like, I love to do this part because it's, uh, it was from that movie, the first phono film. And it was, that the poster that you saw was about this part. It's called The New Father of Paris. It's doing my voice, it's doing my voice. If it was a closed place, yes, it would have been easy to sing without the mic. And the fans are noisy. Yeah, as well. It's quite open. No, you will bake. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll come there and, and do a father. If you can't hear me, it's your fault. <laughs> so this is called Rua de Kapulau, which is the street, the name of the street where Maria Sivel lived and where her house still exists today, which is now a Kazu It exists in the Moradia section of Lisbon. Um, 
where you can actually say that father was born.